Welcome to our listeners who are tuning into The Do Winter Difference, an audio podcast where I spend a bit of time with incredible executives I've known for years, and you get to listen in. I hope that our conversations are unique, insightful, short enough to hold your attention, but long enough so that you get some great takeaways that you can apply in your own career, life, and relationships. Today, I am very pleased to speak with my friend, Karen Taylor, Chief Diversity Officer at Workday. Prior to Workday, Karen led global diversity, equity, and inclusion teams at Genentech and Cisco, and as she has done throughout her distinguished career, she gives even more of herself, supporting organizations that further the advancement of women leaders in our communities and corporations. I absolutely adore my friend Karen and respect her immensely as a person and a professional. However, I will share with you that of the thousands of interviews I've done in my career, my very first meeting with Karen did scare the heck out of me just a little bit. Karen, thanks for joining us today. And do you remember our first meeting? Hey, Derek. Good to <laughs> good to be speaking with you. And I do remember our first meeting, but I don't know why it scared you so bad. I wanted to impress you probably more than I wanted to impress a lot of people in my life. I'm not going to lie. So yeah, it made me a little nervous. That's hilarious. Well, I remember the meeting being a fantastic meeting, and I remembered meeting you thinking, ah, oh, what a wonderful person. I hope I get to work with him a bit more. So um, I hope I'm less scary than I was back then. It, that was a, This is a me problem for sure. <laughs> but I did. I mean, I, I certainly wanted to impress you quite a bit. We were forming or, or I guess advancing the board for Watermark, a board that we both served on um, for a mm. few years. And I really, really wanted you on the board desperately. Uh, so I, I definitely want to make a good impression. Well, you did your job because I actually joined the board. So even better yet. <laughs> there you go. All right. So I've got a few questions for you. The first is probably the most complicated one. I can't seem to quite phrase it perfectly. Uh, and I shouldn't admit that as we get out of the box here. But well, let me see if I can pull this one off reasonably well. So let's pretend you have $100 in your pocket to purchase attributes that you believe have made you a successful executive that you can't live without. And the more you spend on a specific attribute, the less you can spend on others. For instance, if I believe that intelligence was the single most, most important attribute I possess, which is, I can hear you noise in the background as if there was laughing, that has helped me get to where I am, I might spend $80 on that and $20 on other attributes, but you only have $100. So where would you start allocating your money? Ooh, it's such a good question. I'm I'm not sure how I would allocate it across all the different attributes, but I would imagine that close to 100% would be directed towards attributes that make the world a better place. So for me, it would be things like empathy and cultural intelligence and being open-minded and things like humility and curiosity and compassion and courage. So as much as, you know, strategy and communications and those types of things are all needed, I'd probably lean on things that I think would make us a better world. That's as good of an answer as I could possibly think of. What is in the news and in the market a whole lot lately is AI. And you can't kind of you can't do anything without hearing about it one way or the other. And as it relates to the role of a diversity offer, officer, are you more concerned or more excited about the impact on the way you do your job going forward? Yeah, it's a great question. And I would say probably a little bit of both. You know, I'm excited about the opportunities that AI will bring to the world. And so if I think about things like diversity reporting as an example, AI is going to help out tremendously. So just imagine that I need a report. It's on some demographics. And let's assume I need a report on, let's just say, the number of Asian women who have been promoted in the last five years from North America, Europe, and Asia. And I'd like to understand what leadership skills have been most beneficial for that person within years one and five. That would be a very complicated report for me to get today. AI is going to be able to give me that information literally in seconds. And so for those types of reasons, I'm excited about AI. But on the other hand, I'm also a little bit concerned. So, you know, most of my concerns really have to do about, honestly, Derek, the efficacy of people and how humans may misuse AI. And so I'm, I'm more so worried about the unintentional consequences of AI and people just not using it in the wrong, in the right way or 
us not thinking long enough downstream to really understand the, the true impacts that are going to come from AI. And so those are the kinds of things that I'm worried about, ethical AI practices and consistency across really the world on how AI should be used for good, I think is really important because as we both know, AI will be used um, in a negative and a bad way as well. And I think we just have to be aware of that um, and that we have to mitigate some of the bad behavior as much as we can. But honestly, I'm pretty optimistic. I'm pretty cautiously optimistic um, about what's to come with AI. Excellent. Uh, what would you tell your younger self about how we've done in the last 25 years in corporate America as it relates to developing diverse organizations? And in, in sharing your thoughts with your younger self, would she, the young you, be surprised to know we've come this far or would she be disappointed we've not made even further strides? Mm, God, it's such a good question. So I would probably tell myself probably three things. The first thing would be, I told you this would be a long, hard fight, <laughs> and it has been. But honestly, I would also say that every moment of pain has been worth the advancement, whether or not that advancement has been big or small. The amount of effort that we actually put into this work is really important. And it feels often like we are not making a ton of progress. But if I reflect on how this conversation has really shifted from being really just about women, you know, 20 years ago and trying to get women into leadership and more women into our companies to today where we're talking about things like belonging for all, I think the conversation has certainly changed and, and I'm excited about that. I think the next thing is I'd probably say, you know, we've made some impressive strides. And although it may not always feel like that, we have to celebrate the wins along the way. Because as I mentioned, all of those wins become extremely important. But like I said, you you tend to forget all the accomplishments that have been made because the, the work can really be daunting. And then I think the third thing is, honestly, we have a lot more work to do. Um, and the best way that we can do it, honestly, is together. So there are a lot of people out there that are doing work in the DEI space of all shades and, and colors and walks of life. But as I think about where I do my best work, Derek, it's in having conversations like this with people like you and people who are, you know, a similar thought track as we think about what is it going to take to make this world a better place for all people. And so there's a lot of progress that we've made. I'm excited about it. But yeah, there's still a lot more that we need to do as a society. And like I said, we can we can definitely do this work together but a lot to do. It's interesting. We've talked about this a lot over the course uh, of the years that we've known one another. And these are hard questions to step into, but they don't seem so hard after you've had the conversations. Uh, the hard part then is the work to, you know, to make things better and to understand one another more. But sometimes that very first step is one you don't take because you're so nervous about the things you might say or, or the wrong things you might do. But if, if you don't take that first step, you don't get anywhere. I, you are so right. And right now, today, one of the things that I think is really polarizing in our country right now is honestly the fact that we will not listen and talk to each other anymore, right? It doesn't really matter what side of the spectrum you are on, on any topic today, we've gotten to a point to where we, we are at an impasse and we will we refuse to hear one another. And I think the more we can just let down the blinders and hear the other side, and, and it's not to move you over to the other side or make you think like I think. It really is about us having the opportunity to learn more from each other and understand one another so we can move forward together with that understanding. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a question that's really related to kind of corporate America, how far we may or may not have come in, over the course of the past 25 years. But you have exposure to teams that are outside uh, the United States, um, certainly outside of the Bay Area nationally and internationally. How would you characterize or kind of compare the approach to equity inclusion in those regions or areas mm -hmm. of the world? 
Yeah, it's such a good question. You know, as I've been doing this work over the last, you know, 20 or so years, what I have found is that DEI is different around the world because our demographics are different around the world. And what I find is that we focus on what's closest to us. So if I think about North America as an example, we focus a lot on gender and race or, or ethnicity, but we're also focused on things like disability and caregiver, caregivers we saw through the pandemic that this notion of really folk being focused on caregivers, both for those who are caring for the young and the elderly, is a real pocket of concern for us as a nation. And so that's an area that we are focused on. But if I look across Europe, part-time work is something that they focus on a lot. People with disabilities, how do they get more women into leadership? All of those things are important. But here's what I'll tell you. Even with all the nuances, I have found that there is some common ground and it is this notion of belonging. And so regardless of your location or your demographics, ensuring that people feel like they belong has really been the common thread as companies and countries are continuing to move forward. And so there's something that just keeps bringing us back to this notion of belonging. And that I think is, is, is extremely um, interested. And at the end of the day, you look, people want to work for a workplace where they feel welcomed, like they feel heard, like they feel appreciated. And so the more I hear from chief diversity officers and chief people officers and CEO, CEOs, they're honing in on this notion of belonging. And <clears throat> A lot of times, you know, Derek, we often talk about, well, what is belonging? And one of the things that I've been that I have been working on is identifying what is belonging and how does that show up? And I've been looking at it through this lens of peace. And I'll share that with you really quickly. And so I did a little bit of research around like, what is it that makes me feel like I belong? And it was these five tenets, psychological safety, empathy, acceptance, connection and feeling embraced. And when you put those together and those things spell out peace, those are the things that make someone like me feel like I belong. And so I think there is something true in this notion of wanting to bring out the goodness in people through this lens of peace or belonging. That's pretty awesome. We actually just did a video DEI and B belonging exercise <laughs> today in our in our company, ironically. And so I, I see the word belonging, you know, as something that has been being really highlighted today uh, or more recently than I have seen it in the months prior to this. So it's, a, it's another additional piece of the entire puzzle, right? Yeah, both belonging. And then the other word that comes up a lot is equity right? Mm -hmm. How do we just not make people feel like they belong, but how do we make everybody feel like they belong? Mm -hmm. And how do we make sure that we're creating an equitable experience for everyone? Well, you are such a thoughtful and interesting person. So what would you be doing if you weren't in a senior leadership HR diversity role like you're in now? <laughs> if I was it doing- It can be it, anything. I... It can be anything. <laughs> Literally anything. It would be one of two things. I would either be a talk show host because I love sitting on the other side like you and asking questions like this, or I would be an actress. And then if you were to ask me this question, like in the last probably three or four years, I might even be a professional pickleball player. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, awesome. Speaking of an actress, uh, did you see the Barbie movie? I did. I did. Did you like it? I did. <laughs> okay. What is the thing you like the most and the least? out of the movie. And I saw it too, by the way. So the thing I like the most, honestly, was that you were either called Ken or Barbie. I thought that that was such a great way to talk about diversity. And so that I, I definitely loved. And there wasn't anything that I really didn't like about it. What I did, uh, what I enjoyed is it was a really, it was a movie from my genre and was really talking about things that I had forgotten about in some cases as well. And so, but I, I enjoyed it. I've spoken to a lot of people who have either loved it or they've hated it, but I, I enjoyed it. No, I thought it was, I thought it was great. My wife was definitely like hitting my arm going, oh my God, I had that. Oh my God, I had that. I, the, I remember the pool. I remember this, all those kind of things. Well, I tell you what, I, you've been on the receiving end of a lot of questions for me. So I get to throw the, this is, this is not a safety move on my part at all by letting you ask a final question. And I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. 
of me. So I will let you have the stage for your talk show host endeavors. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining me today, Derek. <laughs> my, first, <laughs> my first question for you is, why should everyone, including cisgender white men like yourself, care about DEI? What's really in it for them? How would you articulate that? Well, that's an easy question to answer, of course. Wow, that's a big one. I think, you know, I kind of, I, I view the world in a sense of like, there should be a place, and you used the word peace earlier, there should be a safe place for everyone to exist, live, share questions and answers, or questions, thoughts. And if I don't provide an opportunity for those around me to be in a safe place, then I'm not doing a very good job of making whatever is around me, whether it's my house or my community or my workplace or the world greater. I'm, I'm not I'm not doing my best to make it a better place. And so, you know, I I tend to I think about this a lot more as I get older. I suppose I probably didn't think of this way when I was 20 or 30 or certainly even younger. But as I get older, I think I need to be. I should be doing more because it's simply the right thing to do for those around me. And a byproduct of that is it's a better thing for me too. I get more authentic, real connections with people. And if I'm not doing my part, then I don't get those. Maybe it's a selfish move I get a little bit too, but like I, I love authenticity and conversation and relationships. And if you're not creating uh, a platform for that and the things that you do and say, then I think it's kind of a big shame on you. I love that. Thank you. <clears throat> and that was unscripted. So I appreciate you answering so authentically. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and I go back, you know, a few years and, and I absolutely appreciate you joining us. I want to thank you again for making the time. And for those listening, it is very worth recognizing that in addition to Karen's very important day job, she is a highly sought after speaker, facilitator and leadership coach on diversity, equity and inclusion and belonging. And um, if you want to hear more from her you should reach out clear and directly to the people around her. And that's uh, all the more important thing to bring up because it's a special thing for us to have you today. And Karen, I thank you so much for joining us. And on a personal note, I thank you so much for your friendship over the years. It means a lot. Uh, thank you so much, Derek. This has been a pleasure. I was so happy to be here with you today. Appreciate all you. Right. Be well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the Do Winner Difference podcast. If you like this episode, head to dewintergroup.com backslash dewinter hyphen difference to catch future episodes and share your thoughts, comments, or suggestions. And make sure to connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. This podcast is produced by the Dewinter Group, the leading recruiting firm in the Bay Area and beyond. We help top companies and people reach their fullest potential through world-class accounting, finance, and technology recruiting services. 